Stage. Welcome to week four of Family Octagon. I want to give a shout out to our Bettendorf and Kiwani campuses, those tuning in online as we join you here from Rock Island. We're actually wrapping up this conversation today because we're, we've been very intentional in understanding that even though we're created for relationships marked by joy and unity and intimacy, many of those relationship spaces are marked by conflict and battle. And it's hard to find those spaces of joy and intimacy. So we've been very intentional in trying to understand how we fight for what matters most in those spaces, especially within our family. And you can find all the previous conversations online, but as we get started today, I want to dig into really a helpful assessment tool that we looked at last week. It's really a grid that helps us understand what we're fighting for and if we're fighting for what matters most. Here's what it looks like. It's just the reality that we have a tension between ourselves and others, and we constantly choose where we live in the tension of living for ourselves or living for others. There's also the tension between kingdom and comfort. Kingdom is the kingdom of God. It's the, it's the kingdom of heaven. It's the place of rule and reign of Jesus. And, and the obstacle, obstacle to kingdom is not earth, it's comfort. And we're constantly called by God to forfeit comfort for kingdom. So what these two tensions do is they create a grid or a framework by which we can assess what we're fighting for and if we're fighting for what matters most. Because the only place we fight for what matters most is up and to the right, when we choose kingdom and others. This is where we love God. This is where we love others. It's where we fight for what matters most. If we're trying to fight for what matters most in any of the other quadrants, we're really not fighting for what matters most. We're fighting for something less. If we choose ourselves and our own comfort, well, now we're in a space of just plain selfishness, pride and ego. If we choose ourselves and our own spirituality, well, we're actually in a self-righteous space at the expense of others. And if we prioritize others and what they prefer, their comfort, we think that's love, but it's actually a form of self-indulgence, and it's not love. This is the space of love. This is where we fight for what matters most, up and to the right. And this grid helps us really assess who or what we serve. Really to ask the question of who or what are we willing to serve at any cost? I mean, are, are we really willing, are we, are we positioned and postured loving Jesus so much that we're willing to sacrifice and serve at any cost? I mean, he calls us to live up and to the right, forfeiting comfort and prioritizing others. See, one of the realities about who we are as humans is that we were created for more. That's your first fill-in if you want to use your note guide today. We were created for more. The, the world we live in, this is a different world than what we were created for. It's fractured. It's complicated. It is less than what it was originally designed to be. And there is still good in it, but much of it is broken. And we were created for more. We were created for more than we often live for. Yet in that space of being created for more, this is where we get the, the, the draw to kingdom. We know we're made for more. We know we're made for kingdom. There's a tension in that space and really an opportunity to live up and to the right. But up and to the right, living for more is costly. It, it, it is, this up and to the right is always for more. The down and to the left is always for less. It is costly to live in this space. There's demand in it. There's sacrifice in it. The complexity of human beings around us is just wear and tear on us. And in that space, we can actually get to a point where we want to tap out. We want to quit. The idea of tapping out comes from mixed martial arts fighting, cage fighting. It, tap out literally means this in definition, to surrender, to quit, give up, accept defeat, throw in the towel. It, it, it is when a a fight is occurring or a, a, a match is happening that, that the one opponent taps the other or taps the ground and says, I'm out. You win. I, I admit and acknowledge defeat. And I think it's safe to say that every one of us at some point in our journeys, whether it's been in our marriage, with our families, in our workplace, in our neighborhood, with friendships, we, we've been tempted to tap out. And some of us have. The challenge is, if we're going to live up and to the right, it requires us to push through. I believe that nearly every breakthrough in our life is contingent upon a decision of whether we're going to continue to lean up and to the right or whether we're going to tap out. Whether we're going to continue to press into kingdom, into the, the ground rules and realities of God, or whether we're just going to tap out and choose our own 
comfort, and ourselves. It's the difference between continuing and breaking through or not, to step up and to the right or to tap out. See, there's a concept that's going to help shape our conversation today because there's a fundamental reality that God has created each one of us very specifically, designed specifically. And our design positions us with some things that we can't do. By design, by our purpose, by limitation, how the, the way that God has created us, there are things we can't do. But also by our design, he has given us choice. He's given us free will. So is there, there is a reality that there are things that we won't do. This has to do more with heart. This has to do more with belief and trust and faith. There are things that we can't do and there are things that we won't do. And the reality is that we can tap out in either one of them. We can tap out because we can't or we can tap out because we won't and we need to know the difference. It's important that we understand that because it plays directly into fighting for what matters most. We can tap out in either space. Now, in this conversation, as we have leaned into this as a church family, in our family octagon journey, we have leaned into a couple of key conversations that really position us for today's conversation. We started week one and face off, really just understanding how we view ourselves and how we view others is important. It's foundational. Then we rolled into the ground rules reality of uh, how do we fight the right fight the right way? How do we follow the rules? Because no, you only win if you follow the rules. And, and then training days helped us last week really look at how we, what we do before the fight is just as important as what we do in the fight. And then today we're going to lean into the reality of never tapping out. Because we need to understand how fighting for what matters most plays out in the can't and won't dynamic. Now let me once again make the same disclaimer I've made the whole way through this conversation. The whole way through this series. That when we're talking about fighting for what matters most, we're not talking about physical altercations or aggression. We're talking about fighting for intimacy, fighting for genuine community and healthy relationships. We're not talking about being aggressive, but about, about being intentional, fighting for what matters most. And there are places and spaces when they're unhealthy, when they're abusive, when they are unsafe, that it requires a different response. Unsafe dynamics require different and special consideration. And in those spaces, sometimes it is right to walk away and sometimes to, to involve authorities into that. But in the day-to-day -day dysfunction of people, of people being people, there are very real opportunities for us to fight for what matters most, and that often requires not tapping out. So what I want to do is actually look at an example of this in Scripture today. We turn to the Bible to know how we're supposed to live, and so I want to invite you to grab your Bible if you have one. Turn or click to the Gospel of Matthew, it's the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19. And, and the book of Matthew is written by a guy named Matthew, surprise, surprise, but he's also known as Levi. And he was a Jewish tax collector who was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And he specifically wrote this book to his fellow Jewish brethren to do two things. To prove that Jesus actually was Messiah and to explain kingdom. And within this book and the passage we're looking at today is a clear call to live up and to the right. Up and to the right. So we're in Matthew chapter 19. We're going to be starting with verse 16. You can follow along in your own Bible or up here on the screen or in your note guide. And as we do, be listening to the family octagon realities because we're going to see the things we've been talking about play out in a, an exchange between Jesus and a man, a rich young man, who was really seeking to fight for what matters most. So let's take a look at this, follow along as we go. Verse 16 in Matthew 19. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. Now he starts out by pursuing some ground rules. He's looking for the right ground rules, but he, he, he's off track a little bit. His, his question isn't quite where it should be, but, but Jesus is trying to recalibrate him and pull him back to what he really needs to be asking and understanding. So here's what Jesus says. If you want to enter life, that's eternal life, the kingdom, keep the commandments. Keep the ground rules. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus could have said, follow all the ground rules, because that's the invitation. But he focuses on a handful that would connect directly to his journey, his life, his process in pursuing the kingdom. 
But the man says, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Now what he actually lacked was more training and, and more sacrifice. Here's what Jesus says, verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. So he's saying, live up and to the right. It's kingdom and others first. Invest in kingdom, prioritize others. And then he says, out of that invitation to live up and to the right, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Okay, so just reading this, we can begin to see many of the family octagon realities that we've been talking about. We just go back to them briefly. Face off, the, how we view ourselves and others. That's playing out in where this thing lands. How this man viewed himself and how he viewed others determined a bit of the outcome. The ground rules played into it as, as well, following the rules. Even knowing that how we prepare ahead of time is just as important as what we do. Well, how we prepare now actually determines where we end up. The, the result of the, the battle, result of the fight. But what I want to do is drill down into this never tap out reality. Because this young man ended up not fighting for what matters most because he tapped out. He tapped out. But why did he tap out? Why did he tap out? Was it, was it because he, he got, I said, I can't or I won't? Was it can't or won't? Won't. He said it was won't. It wasn't that he couldn't. It was that he wouldn't which is really important that he chose this spot here. He said, look, the sacrifice is just too great. The cost is too high. But what he didn't understand was the kingdom he was seeking requires and calls us to forfeit comfort. It calls us to sacrifice. It calls us to position kingdom and others ahead of ourselves and our own comfort. He missed that reality. And he also missed the reality that Jesus was trying to position him to live his life on a platform of the principles of Jesus, the, the kingdom of Jesus, the realities of Jesus, that if he would follow him, Jesus would change the can't and won't realities. But he missed it. And he ends up in the worst possible place, the most awkward place. He ends up in the won't category, walking away sad. So what he ends up not doing, he does not choose to live up and to the right. He doesn't even choose to live up and to the left. The kingdom he's asking about is not the thing he chose. He didn't choose kingdom and self. He ultimately chose self and comfort. He ended up down and to the left at the expense of others, at the expense of kingdom. He ended up down and to the left, not up and to the right. Not because he couldn't, but because he, he wouldn't. Now, I don't know how close he was to breakthrough, but I know he tapped out too soon. And he lived down and to the left, not because he couldn't, but because he wouldn't. So understand this. This side of the equation is won't. This side of the equation is can't. And there's a reality when it comes to others in kingdom that's beyond us, but we'll hold that for a second. Because I don't know how close this man was to breakthrough, but I know he tapped out too soon. Because right after this, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples, and they're talking about how, how does a rich man enter heaven? What's the deal with that? It gets kind of heavy. It gets kind of complicated. And Jesus says, hang on a second, guys. Listen, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So the can't dynamic, the can't part of the equation is removed when we follow Jesus. We can live up and to the right with him. Now, I mentioned earlier that each one of us have probably been in a space at some point in our life where we've been tempted to quit, tempted to just simply tap out, to just say, man, I'm done. And in that space, because of whether it was a big or small thing or public or private or maybe it was even right or wrong, in that tempted space, we can tap out when we're not supposed to. But the key to fighting for what matters most is to never quit leaning up and to the right. To, to never quit there, prioritizing kingdom and others. To, to never tap out. The, the moment we do, we're no longer living for what matters most. We're living for lesser things, and those lesser things distract us for the things that actually lead us to more. And that's exactly what happened to the rich young man. He began to live for lesser things that distracted him from more. He chose down to the left rather than up and to the right. And he walked away sad. 
You know, Winston Churchill is credited with giving a commencement speech that simply consisted of this. Never give up, never give up, never give up, and then he sat down. <laughs> Preach a sermon like that, pastor. <laughs> Listen, uh, that, that's kind of cool. Sounds fun, but it's not actually what happened. It's not quite accurate. See, what happened was actually almost 77 years ago to the day, October 29th, 1941. October 29th, 1941, Winston Churchill went to his alma mater and he gave some remarks. Now you have to understand the dynamic in this season was that the United Kingdom, Great Britain, they were, they were in, a, in a, a, a battle and conflict that would ultimately turn into World War II for up to nearly two years without a whole lot of support, without allies like the U.S. having engaged at this point. It was dire. It was costly. There was a lot of uncertainty in that space. And here's what he said in his remarks. He said, this is the lesson. Never give in, never give in, never, 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 never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. These words inspired and strengthened and emboldened the resolve of a nation in a very difficult time. And I think they can even be helpful for us today as we seek to fight for what matters most. And I believe they could have been helpful for the rich young man in his space if he had been given these kinds of words. Because I am convinced that you and I are often just one up and to the right decision away from breakthrough. Just, just one up and to the right decision away from next level relationship with God or others. One decision away of just deciding to continue rather than tapping out. One decision away from what we're truly seeking. I came across a story actually this week um, about a family during the, the gold rush days. The last name was Darby. And they, one of the family members went out to Colorado, staked a claim because they wanted to get a part in this gold rush reality. And they were out there a few, for a few weeks digging around and they found gold and it was promising. So much so that they covered it back up, went back to Williamsburg, Maryland, talked to their family and some friends to raise the money to get the equipment they would need to actually start a mining process. They were able to raise the money, ship the equipment back out to Colorado, and they traveled back out and began to dig in. And the first carload of ore that they sent to the smelter came back saying, this is the promise of, a, of being the largest gold strike in Colorado. And they were stoked. With high hopes, they started drilling down more and started digging in. But within a very short period of time, the gold dried up. Frustrated, they continued to just dig further and further and further, not really finding anything. After a period of time, they actually quit. They tapped out. Sold their equipment and the property to a junk man for about a few hundred dollars. And that junk man, knowing he didn't really understand mining, hired a mining engineer to come in and just survey the dynamic. And what that engineer discovered was that the Darby family didn't understand fault lines. And that what he did through his calculations and predictions determined that the Darby family he believed had stopped three feet short of finding that gold. So that junk man, you know what he did? He dug that three feet and he found it. See, I believe most of us are one up and to the right decision away from breakthrough. From, from that next level relationship with God, being in a space to see more if we just don't quit, never give up. That, that never give up imagery can be seen in a picture of a stork and a frog. Maybe you've seen this. Never give up. <laughs> and for some of you, that's inspiring. For some of you, it's alarming. And for others, you find it funny. <laughs> it really all depends on how much you care about frogs and storks. I get that. But more than that, I think it's important to really understand who we relate to more in this. The, the stork or the frog. The never give up challenge actually applies both ways. That Winston Churchill's advice, never give in, never give in, never, 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 applies in both directions for the stork and for the frog. Regardless if you feel more like the frog or you feel more like the stork, never quit. Regardless if you identify either way, the principle is powerful, never quit. But I wonder where you're tempted to do so. I wonder where you're tempted to tap out in a can't or won't dynamic. The rich young man tapped out too soon in a won't dynamic. Now, some of you may know this about me, but I actually tapped out on pastoral ministry at the age of nine. 
See, I grew up in a pastor's home, and I believe God was tugging and pulling me in that direction, preparing me for what he actually had. And, and I remember at the age of nine having a distinct conversation with him saying, God, I'll serve you wherever you want. I just don't want to be a pastor. And it wasn't so much my dad. It was what I saw in the cost and complexity of church ministry, the, the sacrifices associated with it, the, the, the exposure publicly to it, just the dynamics of it. And, and I just wasn't ready to serve at any cost in that role. I was sincere in wanting to serve him, but it was limited. And what I was struggling to do is I was choosing self and comfort because I didn't want to, to step into the cost of kingdom and others. And I am truly grateful that God is slow to anger and abounding in love because 40 years later, I'm serving as a pastor and I am, I am privileged and thrilled to be able to do this. But it's not in my might because I can't. But there was a season in my life where I was, because I thought I couldn't, I was saying I wouldn't. And he was gracious in that. Because there are things in the up and to the right dynamic that are unpleasant, they are painful, they are complicated. But they're worth it. We've been looking at a scripture throughout this series that's helped anchor us and move us along. It's in Hebrews, it's chapter 12, verse 11. It says this, for, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There are spaces and places that just feel uncomfortable and unpleasant, even living up and to the right, but never quit. Never quit. Don't tap out. It is too easy to quit. It is too easy to say, I won't. In our marriages, in our families, our friendships. Where are you tempted to tap out even today? To say you won't. See, we, we do quit. We, we step out of the up and to the right dynamic. We do things we know we shouldn't do. And we, we fight the wrong way for the wrong things in our relationships. But usually that happens when three things start to intersect in our lives. Three things start to intersect. We, we tap out on kingdom and we tap out on God and others. That usually happens and it's usually preceded by three things intersecting. Those three things are simply this, desire, opportunity, and time. Desire, opportunity, and time. When, when these three things align, we make different decisions than when they don't. Now, we could look at this in both a positive and negative, and because we're talking about tapping out on God and tapping out on kingdom, I want to talk about the unhealthy expression of this. Because whenever we have a desire, we're, we have a hunger, we have an attraction, we have a, a, a craving, a lust, whether it's big or small, public or private, we have that want. And, we, and that desire, that want lines up with an opportunity. The opportunity being that, that we actually can get our hands on the thing. It's available. That person that we have an attraction to, uh, we can get in proximity to. When, when desire lines up with opportunity and opportunity lines up with time, when there is space in the day, there is room for it or for that moment, well, then we end up making poor decisions. But if any one of those pieces of desire, opportunity, and time can be pulled out of alignment, we end up making different decisions. When they line up, we tap out. When they line up, we choose comfort and self when they line up, we let lust and appetite and, and desire reign and rule and prevail. We, we look at things we shouldn't look at. We do things we shouldn't do. We take things that we shouldn't take. When they line up, it's a dot day, D-O-T. When they line up, we don't fight for what matters most. We sin. We run from what is right. And we quit. We, we tap out. In Romans 7, Paul talks about how we don't do the things we should do, and we do the things we shouldn't do. That is an expression of the can't and won't dynamic fed by dot days. Can't and won't fed by dot days. Just do this with me for a moment in your own head. I want you to think of the last time you did something you know you shouldn't do or shouldn't have done. And this is the kind of thing you know God didn't want you to do, but ended up doing it anyway. And we all have done it. Maybe it's been around a habit, a, a craving, an appetite, some kind of anger, lust, desire, whatever. Just think of the last time you did something you know God didn't want you to do. I think it's likely that having desire, opportunity, and time line up led to doing what you did not want to do. That sin, that, that regret, that, that shame. 
But even if one of them had been removed, one brought out of alignment, it's likely we wouldn't have tapped out in the good fight, but actually made a different decision. Now again, you can flip dot day to something positive, but again, I want to focus on how we tap out on God and others and kingdom. And whenever we see a dot day lining up, desire, opportunity, and time forming around the thing we struggle with, if we can just change one of them, it changes the outcome. You don't have to manage all of them in the moment. You just need to manage one. Let me, let me explain how this plays out. If you have a desire for someone you shouldn't have desire for or something you shouldn't have desire for, replace it with something up and to the right. Replace it with God. Get into his word and, and start to think about other things that will shift your heart's desire. If the opportunity piece is what's lining up for you, you're alone. That thing is available. Your computer is available. If you're in that space, remove the opportunity by walking away. Or, or go be with others so you're not alone. Or if it's the time piece that, that, that's actually showing up where there is room that you are alone in that space. There's, a, there's room for the action or the activity or the, the relationship that shouldn't be. Just removing one breaks the downward slide to tapping out. Just remove one. The, the rich young man, he actually had the right desire in the beginning to go and find out how to pursue kingdom. And he, and he created the right opportunity by going to see Jesus. And he had the time to, to go and sell and give and then follow Jesus. He had that all thing. That whole thing was in line. But when, he, when desire and opportunity and time lined up for him to choose self and comfort, it all spun backwards. His desire for his own comfort and his own wealth is what led him to, to tap out. It all shifted back. And, and I get, we quit. We do. But God has grace in that. He calls us back to being up and to the right. When we quit in our marriage, we quit in our families, when we step out of the up and to the right equation, when, when we actually do what we shouldn't do, it's often because desire and opportunity and time. We allow desire and opportunity and time to align. And that's when we make poor decisions. But we can avoid that dynamic and we can live up and to the right consistently by understanding how to position us to do so. Now, I have three things that allow us to do that, but before we step into that, I want to just acknowledge what I think blows this thing up most often, what, what causes failure in this most often. See, I think whenever we end up in a space that we're stepping out of the up and to the right dynamic or we're choosing ourselves, I think it happens when we think we're owed something, when we're entitled to something, that, that we deserve better, because in that kind of space, that's when we choose ourselves. That's when we choose ourselves. If you have ever experienced betrayal, if you've ever experienced being let down by someone else or experienced significant loss, you know that that is most often the most tempting place to tap out. Anytime that we're, where things aren't going well, where we're experiencing pain or where things are unpleasant, we're in an unpleasant season, that's when we want to tap out. Tap out on God and tap out on others. It's in that space. But the truth is, there is no relationship, no long-lasting relationship in our lives that isn't marked by grace and forgiveness, including our relationship with God. So if we're going to actually live up and to the right, there's got to be a space for grace. There's got to be a space for forgiveness. If we're not willing to live into that space, we're more likely to tap out. And, and, and whether you have gotten this wrong and you live down in the left, or, or maybe you've been living up and to the right and you have been wronged, the reality is that fighting for what matters most is always worth it. If you have loved well or you live down and to the left, the opportunity in the spaces that are hard of being wronged, we still have the opportunity to fight for what matters most, to continue living up and to the right. And it is always worth it. Don't tap out. Don't tap out. Listen, in the pain of the, the, the things I just described, we can feel like we have justification to shift from down, up into the right to some other quadrant. But that's not actually how it works. In fact, there's a really great reminder out of the book of Psalms that maybe will be helpful for some of you today. Psalm 15, who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? That's a great question. I think all of us want to be with God. We want to worship with God. We want to be in proximity to him. So who gets to do that? A few verses later, the psalmist says, those who keep their promises... Those who keep their promises, even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. That's profound. That's challenging. 
That's a call to live up and to the right. To keep our promises even when it hurts. Look, if you have ever experienced a pain, a betrayal, a brokenness that has caused you to think that it justifies moving down into the left, regroup and recalibrate, it's not. When, when we encounter that pain, we think we're owed something. And in that space, we choose ourselves. And, and we can break our promises in our marriage. We can break our promises to our kids or to our friends. We can sin. We can run. We can tap out. But now, although God understands the pain we're in, and he sees it, he wants to be with us in it, he wants to work good things out of it, if we won't tap out in it, even though he actually understands our pain, God's understanding of our pain is not an excuse for sin. God's understanding of our pain does not excuse our sin. But in that space, when we're feeling that stuff, we can feel like it's justified, and we can be tempted to move down into the left. The rich young man, he did that. He's like, man, that cost is too great. I'm going to head down over here. God's understanding of the pain that you've experienced is not an excuse to step into sin or rejection of the up and right lifestyle, up into the right posture. It's easy to tap out, to walk away, to not fight for what matters most. The rich young man, he did it. And he chose, he chose comfort and self over kingdom and others. Not to live up into the right. But if you have, if you've been betrayed, if you've been let down, if you've been lied to, I know the pain is real. But we're called to keep our promise, even when it hurts. That's what living up into the right means. And the opportunity to do that is especially real when there's repentance, when there's a pathway to reconciliation and restoration. This is too important. To not keep our promises when it hurts actually impacts our ability to be with God. It's proximity. Who can worship in the sanctuary? Those who keep their promises even when it hurts. Pain alone is not an excuse to tap out. Tap out on God, your spouse, or, or your kids. If you're in that space and you're not really sure what to make of that pain, pray. Talk to God. Ask him to, to really show you the difference between pain that is a result of disobedience, of walking away sad and living down at the left, as opposed to pain that is part of a process of leading to holiness for the sake of kingdom and for the sake of others. Pray and ask him, you know, the difference. Strive to remain in his will. Pain itself does not necessarily mean anything about, like, are you in God's will or not? Jesus perfectly walked with God, obeyed everything, did everything perfect, and his life was marked with complexity, marked with pain, hardship, difficulty. It's obedience and faithfulness to live up into the right that matters most. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, I, I, think, I think that Jesus was tempted to tap out. I, I say that because right before he's heading into crucifixion, he's having a conversation with God, and he actually says to him, he says, like, take this cup from me. Take, take this fight from me. Take this task from me. Now, I'm not saying he would have tapped out or that he was getting ready to do it, but I think there was a temptation to tap out because he could see the arrest was coming, the mockery, the, the betrayal, the abuse, the pain, the, the abandonment of the 11 disciples. Like, he, he could see all that, the, 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 the hardship that led to death, but he didn't tap out. He lived and died up and to the right. And that's what he calls us to do. To live and die up and to the right, not to tap out. So whatever you're facing in your marriage, the complexity in your family, at work, whatever it is, I want you to know and understand that even in a space, if you, if you, were, if you are, won't say I won't, and you know there's a difficulty to get to can't, listen, all things are possible with God. All, with God, all things are possible. Don't live in the want space. Step into the up and the right quadrant where maybe you can't, but he can. There's a difference in that space where he's able to work and move. With him, God, with God all things are possible. So let's just get to some training tips for the week. Some things that help us to avoid the dot day and, and live up and to the right. The first thing is simply to remain faithful. To remain faithful. Faithful to the task, faithful to persevere, to, to honor your commitment, to live faithfully up and to the right. With God, with others, with your family. To, even when it's hard, even when it hurts, keep the promise. Put your trust and hope in Jesus. Remain faithful. Hebrews 10 says this for us. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope 
we profess for he who promised is faithful. He's faithful so we can be faithful. Remain faithful in your relationships. Press on in your marriage. Press on in your relationships with your kids or your grandkids. Don't tap out. Successful people are not the ones who don't run into problems or never fail. They're the ones who don't stop short, who continue to lean in, who don't tap out, who don't stop three feet short from the thing they're striving for. Remain faithful. Second thing, keep the faith. So remaining faithful is a practice. It's, it's, it's a choice in how we live on a daily basis. Keeping the faith is an internal reality about belief, about our posture of expectancy. It's our heart and our mind. Keep the faith. There are things we don't understand. There's things we can't make sense of. And if I'm honest with you, I have more than once had the conversation with God. Like, I don't understand, Lord, what you're orchestrating or what you're allowing. Because he orchestrates and allows things. He never orchestrates sin or evil, but he does allow sin or evil. And in those spaces, I don't always understand, but in those spaces, we can choose to trust. We can still choose to lean in, not quit, but still lean up and to the right. And the fastest way we get up and to the right is to abandon ourselves to Jesus. Say, Jesus, take over. Because the reality is, I don't want to say won't, but I also know I can't. So help me live into the reality of fighting for what matters most and not quit on God, not quit on my family, not quit on my marriage. Really, hopefully, all of us positioned as Paul was to say this to Timothy. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the work I was to do. I have kept the faith. I've kept the faith. In, in all the battles, kept the faith. I have striven for more up and to the right. If we don't do that, then we end up just walking away sad. We walk away with less. So remain faithful and keep the faith. It's action, that's belief, but then also finish the work. Finish the work. God, God always finishes what he starts so we can do the same thing. And, and Jesus once said this to God in talking with him right before heading off into crucifixion. He said this, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Finish the work. That should be our posture, the same as him, to finish the work, to fulfill our purpose. He created you for more. And if that journey is longer than you expected, and if it involves swallowing frogs you never thought you'd have to swallow, <laughs> lean in and ask him to help you. Pray and ask him for strength. I have often prayed and asked God to help me. I say, God, help me in the space in between. In between resolution, in between now and clarity, in between now and victory, in between now and vindication. Lord, help me in the space in between. It is a space that that we can't live in, but we can because of him. Help me in the in-between. Our flesh may be willing, but it's also weak. So finish the work. The bottom line when it comes to fighting for what matters most actually takes us into Ecclesiastes, where it says the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear him, keep his commandments, follow the ground rules. That's the duty of man. The rich young man, he, he worked in the beginning well. He, he was following the ground rules. He, he sought the right kind of conversation. And even though his question was off base, he went to the right person so that could recalibrate. But in the end, he ultimately tapped out. He tapped out. Not, not because he couldn't, but because he wouldn't. See, the won't space is where we choose ourself. Anytime we lean into kingdom and others, there are can't realities but with God, through Jesus, all things are possible. And what Jesus was inviting the man to was actually inviting him to remain faithful, to keep the faith and to finish the work. When he said, look, go and sell your stuff, give it to the poor and come follow me. He was inviting him to remain faithful, to keep the faith and finish the work. And the, and the invitation to follow Jesus wasn't just about submission to Jesus, it was about proximity to Jesus because when we're with Jesus, all things are possible, things that are beyond us. We, we can't control people, and we can't even live into the full realities of the kingdom on our own. We need the power of God at work in us. And proximity to Jesus allows us to experience that. So when the invitation to remain faithful, keep the faith, and finish the work was the invitation to the rich young man, it's the same invitation to you and I. And it comes from the heart of love of God through Jesus if we're willing to step up into the right, if we're willing to prioritize kingdom over our comfort, and prioritize others over ourselves. So whatever space you're in, whatever complexity you're facing, the invitation is the same. 
My prayer is that you have the courage to step into it. With Jesus, we have courage over fear. We have strength over weakness. We have the ability to live into more when we choose up and to the right in his power and his strength. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I, I am so grateful that even in a world of brokenness and pain and hardship, that you remain faithful and true, that you are more than able. Even in spaces that we can't, you can. But God, I realize we step into places where we say we won't. And God, I pray you'd forgive us for those spaces and places we've gone. If we've ever ended up in a space where we've said we won't, Lord, help us to turn from that and to, and to lean back into you, to lean back up and to the right for more. A space we're willing to sacrifice with no limit for your glory. So Jesus, whatever the next step may be for my brothers and sisters, may you speak as we continue to worship, as we continue to lean into what your word has revealed. God, may you help us to remain faithful, to keep the faith and finish the work. So we'll get to the end of this thing, Lord, and hear you say, well done. Thank you. We pray this in the strong and mighty name of your son, Jesus. And everybody said, amen.